things in your universe as they are in ours, or not, as social order can establish in your universe, or not. Mars, in what shade do you see our Earth from where you stand? Are you aware of our Earth, or not? How strong are the sparkles of love and affection for us? Why? Team Wise Mars, if you visualize all things at once, what catches your passion and curiosity the most from the numerous things on our Earth? Let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, today's date is a notable date in astronomy. Today, 25 years since, the Mars was first date of summer and the longest date of the year of the modern time of the globe. Millions are born all the year since to the world and to quickly elated to unite one of the Mongolian edition of the book The Case for Mars by Robert Zubin and Lucy Bowman. Here today to celebrate the opening ceremony of the Case for Mars in Mongolian with its original author, President of Mars Society, Dr. Robert Zubin. Thank you very much. We express our deepest gratitude for Dr. Zubrin and his beautiful wife, Bob Zubrin, for making the time to come to this beautiful event. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Robert Zubrin first published this book more than 20 years ago, and it has been translated into many different languages since. His book is read by astrophysics researchers and especially Mars lovers, one of them being the current founder of SpaceX, Elon Musk. And he was one of the first people to read the book, and he has taken it as, it, it, as one of his inspirations. Dr. Zubrin has dedicated his whole life to studying and developing one of the future visions of humanity colonizing Mars. This study is a foundation to take Mars vision to the next level. He has been an incredibly valuable advisor to Mars. Everybody, distinguished guests, and our honorable Dr. Zubrin and Ms. Zubrin, um, greetings from Mongolia, from National University of Mongolia and Mars League team. I'm very honored to be here today, and on behalf of the government of Mongolia, Ministry of Digital Development and Communication, as well as the Space Council of Mongolia, I would like to express our sincere appreciation and deepest gratitude for Dr. Robert Zubrin for his contribution and ded dedicated hard work for space study and specifically Mars studies. We are honored to have you here today in Mongolia and we also would like to thank Mars League team for their dedicated hard work for the past two, three years during the pandemic. I know what kind of challenge that they have been going through, but um, the young people and the project leader, leaders have been very, very dedicated to this project. And I'm very glad to see that it's the project is kicking off with Honorable Dr. Mr. Zubrin here today. And uh, the government of Mongolia recently established Ministry of Digital Development and Communication and one of our main focuses is space study. And for this reason, we are, have been also supporting Mars Week project and any Mars uh, space-related studies with policies and in collaboration with Ministry of Education as well. And I really, truly hope that this book, the Mongolian edition of Case for, uh, Case for Mars will encourage many young people to pursue studies and profession in, in Mars studies and in space studies. And thank you so much for, for being here today. And I hope that our collaboration would lead to bigger projects and bigger achievements. Thank you very much. event. Uh, 
Um, we are hopeful and excited that the government is making great leaps and ambitions to contributing to the global effort to reach Mars. Sure is. And speaking about the ambitions, space research is a wide research field nowadays. Material science, earth science, geology, biology, medicine and physics all apply to the space research environment. And we are happy that today National University of Mongolia offers multidisciplinary and distinguished courses in the field of science. <laughs>
where the science is. This is where the future is. And this is where the challenge is. But then you might be thinking, why Mongolia? Because this is where the environment is. The history and the adaptive survival lifestyle is. Here's how. To the eyes of a globalized metropolitan world, Mongolia is a developing nation struggling with resource curse, or even, let's say, a herder nation trapped between the world's greatest economies. But beneath the surface, we have rich history and extreme climate conditions that have transformed our way of living. This hundreds of years of living in Mongolia has transformed its people with adaptive and survival lifestyle skills. Always ready for a challenge. Nomadic Mongolians possess the best knowledge of how to recognize and use resources to its maximum capacity with zero waste in the wilderness environment. A truly competitive lifestyle. And our history proves that. So three things, the environment, the history, and the adaptive survival lifestyle, these three things together define Mongolia's competitive advantage as a nation for its mission. So now, I want to walk you through where we contribute and how we contribute to this mission. Every once in a while, technological advancements are introduced by the governments, but maybe more so now by the space entrepreneurs, making space travel much easier, cheaper, and accessible. So now let's imagine that the transportation system has been created. What's next? Next is the mass settlement. So to establish the mass settlement, there are numerous technologies that need to be developed tested and evaluated, such as smart and space suits, surface vehicles, robots, or even planting greenhouse agriculture in the environment, in the exact extreme environment. And this is what Mongolia has to offer. And this is where we contribute. Just to show some of our, our developments, we have designed the better version of Martian spacesuit, rover, and dome, which is inspired from the tr traditional Mongolian girl. If you want to understand how a traditional Mongolian girl can be the most resourceful and utilized area to inspire for the development of a dome, then I invite you here. And I leave the philosophy to you. Moving on, many developing nations have set their, or let's say developed nations, have set their Mars ambitions. Whether it's public, private, they're somewhat linked with geopolitical agendas. Whereas our contribution is towards creating the Mars-like environment in Mongolia and also preparing the people with adaptive survival skills. And this will be achieved through developing training base, an R&D free zone, and a satellite city. In other words, this will be a truly borderless co-working space. And by that, I mean people from all over the world can come and join forces to collectively contribute to this mission. Mankind's mission for Mars. So to reach this goal, we have passed the test of rationality in the past three years. On an institutional level, we're members of International Mars Exploration Working Group. We're members of Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group. We have presented to NASA, Indian Space Research Organization, and even to President Putin. But I want to highlight over here, we have on board
supporters, many science and thought leaders, led by Dr. Zubrin and Dr. Akiyama as our honorary advisors. Your contributions are greatly valued. On the internal side, for the past three years, we have the feasibility study approved by the Minister of the Environment and Tourism. We have established the government working group, which is aimed towards creating a fostering, nurturing environment for investment and public-private partnership in developing Mars in the project. And very excitingly, very recently, we have obtained the right to use land in the Gobi for this exact mission. So, to conclude, our message is that Mongolia has a space mission. Mongolia has a Mars mission, mission backed by reasons. We have government support. We have legislative support. We have scientific support. Support. And most importantly, we have our people's support. Mongolia is ready to enter the global vision for Mars, and our commitment to it is absolute. We need supporters, we need investors, and we need you. translating uh, my book into Mongolian, um, and uh, frankly for the work that you're doing uh, and the extremely important work that you're about to do to advance the prospects of humans to Mars. Um, and I'd like to also just uh, take this moment to announce that uh, as of uh, today, Mars V is now the official uh, Mongolian Mars Society. So we have joined together. Um, so, say at all interesting, you can now read about it in full in the book, which um, has, um, is now available as of today uh, in Mongolian, or if you prefer, it's still available in English, um, or Parusi. Um, anyway, it's out there. So given the limitations of time, I'm going to uh, go very rapidly through the elements of the flights to Mars, although I, I do have to discuss why this is now possible. Um, but also I want to focus a lot uh, more on what we will do when we are on Mars, because this is the part of the mission where I think Mongolia can play an extraordinary role in preparing uh, humanity to do this. Uh, and. Um, Okay, so first of all, you sometimes see pictures like this of how we can go to Mars. And this is a very uh, futuristic uh, spaceship here. Uh, you'll notice it looks just like an Imperial Star Destroyer. Uh, it's quite large, Mars is here for scale. Um, and um, clearly, if this is what is needed to go to Mars, we're not going to Mars in our time. But I don't believe that this is what is needed to go to Mars. This is uh, a grand image for space movies, science fiction, lots of fun. I like those movies myself. But as an engineer, you don't want to come up with a plan to go to Mars with giant spaceships. You want to have a plan to go to Mars with little spaceships um, because they're cheaper um, and a lot more buildable. Um, so uh, now, there are some people who say, well, OK, th there's a better way to go to Mars than that. But before we go to Mars, we need to go to the moon, 
We need to practice Mars missions on the moon. Now, they're right. We should practice Mars missions before we go to Mars. But we don't need to do it on the moon. We can do it on Earth. Now, the Mars Society began pushing this idea, building Mars stations in Mars-like environments. And here is one that we actually built in northern Canada. This is on Devon Island, 75 degrees north, 1,500 uh, kilometers from the North Pole. And it's a pretty Mars-like environment, but it's very hard to get there, very expensive to conduct operations there. And there's also uh, some serious dangers there, like uh, polar bears, uh, which will hunt you. Uh, and so we actually have to accompany our Mars simulation crews with people who are in poor enemy clothes with rifles uh, to protect them. So we used this station, and we used it to demonstrate the utility of these kinds of practice missions. And we've also built then another station in the western United States. But Mongolia is a place beyond compare to do this. And later in the talk, I'll talk a little bit more about why this is the essential part of the mission. This is, after all, the purpose of the mission. The purpose of the mission is not to get there. The purpose of the mission is to explore once you are there. Okay. So, now, we need heavy lift to do the mission. That is one thing we need. But uh, while we've gone a long time now without heavy lift, we once had heavy lift, that's how we got to the moon. This, you're looking at a picture from 1970, um, Saturn V. And uh, this year, uh, Saturn V has not flown since the 1970s, but this year there will be two heavy lift vehicles brought into being, the SpaceX Starship and the NASA SLS. Uh, both uh, will probably fly to orbit this year and this will give us the essential capability we need. Now, this is the Mars Direct Mission Plan, which is it, it discussed at considerable length in the book, which you now have available. So I'm going to explain it real quick. Okay, In a given year, the first year of mission operations, we launch one heavy lift booster, and we use its upper stage to throw an automated payload to Mars. That's an Earth return vehicle. No one is in it. It flies to Mars on a, uh, the slowest trajectory we need, which is eight months to Mars. And then it uses an aeroshell to aero break into Mars orbit, and then we land it on Mars. Um, so there's no one in it. Now, what is in it? Well, the primary object it is taking to Mars is the Earth return vehicle, which is a small rocket ship. And this will, I designed, uh, there's other ways you could design this. You could design it. Little starship, if you like, and probably how Musk will do it. But the um, it has a little cabin. Uh, um, crew of four to go from Mars to Earth in the final leg of the mission on a six-month voyage. It's got two rocket propulsion stages here, uh, which use methane and oxygen rocket propellant, which, however, are, are empty. It, for uh, going out, we have about six tons of liquid hydrogen uh, in the one of the tanks in the lower stage. And slung below the vehicle, not shown in this diagram, is a little truck. Uh, and uh, in the back of the truck, we've got a little nuclear reactor with a power of about 100 kilowatts. And after you land, you land, you drive the truck telerobotically a few hundred meters away, unwinding the people off the back as you go. And then you deploy the reactor. and puts power in the ship, and you run a pump, and you start sucking in the Martian air. Martian air is mostly carbon dioxide gas, 95%. Uh, you react that with hydrogen to make methane, that's natural gas, and water. The natural gas is rocket fuel. In fact, it's the fuel that Starship uses. Uh, and then the water you can split into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen you put in the tank, that's the oxidizer. So, in fact, that's how Starship is going to fly. Methane and oxygen are the two uh, propellants. And, and hydrogen, which you recycle with more methane in it. And then if you want more oxygen, you can just split CO2. Um, so now you're basically filling up 
with uh, methane and oxygen made on Mars from local materials. Uh, if you don't want to bring hydrogen to Mars, you can have another step in which you gather Martian ice, which is, of course, water, and electrolyze it, and that's another way to go. Uh, and I, I've built machines that do exactly this synthesis. So now you have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting late with you on the surface of Mars. And um, so two years after you launch the first, if you launch to Mars every two years, the world launch window that comes around every two years, so two years after Eagle One is year three, you launch two more rockets. One sends out another Earth return vehicle, which will fly to another place on Mars. Uh, and you'll notice I have it going to a different place on Mars. It's an important point, uh, which we'll get to later. And the uh, other sends out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Now, my idea of a Mars habitat, um, it's a little tuna can habitat. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not too different from a gear, uh, except uh, two stories, but you know, it's the same basic idea. Um, and we'd have a crew of four in it. Uh, and uh, here's one potential layout for the upper deck of a half. This, by the way, is eight meters in diameter, uh, which is uh, the same diameter as uh, the tooling that Louisiana, where they made the Saturn V and make the external tanks of the shuttle and make the bottom storage of SLS. Um, so one would make things in this diameter. Um, four little state rooms, okay, um, and then um, a side area, uh, a galley area, uh, and a front area perhaps. Uh, and th then there's a lower deck, which is more of a workshop storage kind of place. Um, and the center here, what we have is called the solar flare storm shelter. That's where you go if there's a solar flare. It's shielded by all the material around it, as well as all the food and water that's wrapped around it. So if, if there's a solar flare, that's your shelter. It, it's good enough to shield out uh, solar flares. Um, cosmic rays, people talk about a lot, but in fact, um, we have already had crews in space, especially the Russians have had many cosmonauts in space, which have experienced cosmic ray doses comparable to what you would get going to Mars and back, and there have been no radiological casualties. Uh, in fact, the, um, the radiation dose of going to Mars and back, uh, by the best estimates, would create about a 1% risk of getting a cancer at some point later in your life. That compares to the average American smoker, which is an extra 20% risk of cancer. So in fact, if you recruited the Mars crew from smokers and sent them to Mars without their cigarettes, you would be reducing their chance of getting cancer. So this is one reason to send people to Mars for their health. Okay, now, uh, I believe that we, uh, the, the main health effect astronauts and cosmonauts have experienced, which has harmed them, is not radiation. It's zero gravity. Because when you're in zero gravity, when you get no exercise, you know, it, it, a normal person on Earth, even if they don't play any sports, even if all they do is, you know, walk to the refrigerator to get something to eat and then go back to the television, uh, they're getting exercise holding up, you know, 70 kilograms against Earth's gravity. In space, you, you don't get that, and the muscles deteriorate. So what I think we should do is create artificial gravity for the crew. This is the upper stage of the booster that flew into Mars, that's going to Mars 2. If you have a tether off of it and you swing this up, you can create Mars gravity in here, you can create Earth gravity, so as to avoid these health effects. And this is important because you're going to Mars to explore, and exploring around on Mars, even though it's got their gravity, you're in a spacer, it's like heavy duty backpacking. Okay, you want the crew to be in decent shape when they get to Mars. It's not that they couldn't get to Mars in zero gravity and live, they could. People go to the space station for six months, and in zero gravity, they come back to Mars, but they're not in good shape, uh, and so it's not the way to go. Um, so they're flying out to Mars, and actually, by speeding things up a bit, 
you can get to Mars in six months, and uh, some of the recent probes actually have. And then you get close to Mars, you fire a pyrotechnic that cuts the cable, and then they go and aerobrick, and they land at landing site number one, where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. If they're too far off course, this other Earth return vehicle is following to Mars. It could be landing near them wherever they did land. But the main plan is to go here and use this one, and then land this one somewhere else. Yeah. In principle, this could be anywhere else. It could be right next door, it could be on the other side of the planet. Uh, but I would put it a few hundred kilometers away. a different place, but we'd like to be within at least the long-range driving range of our site number one in case we ever need to use it. But it goes here, it starts making propellant for the next mission, which will fly there two years later, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, but which otherwise opens up site number three. Okay, so you're multiply backed up. You've got um, two complete Earth return vehicles, either one of which can take you home. You've got a few habitable volumes that cabin to these small Earth return vehicles and a big one in the habitat. Um, okay, but now you're on Mars. And you're gonna be on Mars for a year and a half, okay? So I tell people this is an actual photograph of the Mars base. Yes, it was sent back to the Smithsonian Institute. Anyway, uh, so there's the habitat. Uh, here's the Earth return vehicle, there's the reactor in the background. There's some solar panels with the backup power for the reactor. Um, this is uh, a pressurized rover, and it's about the size of a small SUV you can drive around to explore. This is an inflatable greenhouse. It's not a mission critical element, it's an experiment to learn how to grow crops on Mars. Um, but you're gonna be a year on Mars for a year and a half. Why a year and a half? Because that's the amount of time it will take for the planets to cool down and give you a launch window back to Earth. Okay? But that makes, look, it makes sense. If you take six months to get there and six months to come back, you might as well stay there at least a year. And as it happens, a year and a half is the time you want to stay. Um, now, why are we going? This is a real photograph of the Mars. Okay? This was not sent from the future. This was sent to us from 1976 uh, from the Viking Orbiter. What you see here that is extremely interesting is there are dry riverbeds on Mars, and not just a few, they're all over the place. Okay, there are not canals on Mars as there is in science fiction, that's make believe, but there really are dry riverbeds on Mars. And the geological evidence is, is that there was liquid water on Mars for over a billion years during the planet's early history. And that is five times as long as it took light to appear on Earth once there was liquid water on Earth. Okay. So, if the theory is correct that life evolves from chemistry, from the complexification of chemical compounds in a water-rich environment, and, you know, moderate temperature and so forth, maybe with some geothermal heat around to help things along, uh, if that theory is correct, that the Development of life from chemistry is a natural process to be expected wherever you have the right conditions, then life should have appeared on Mars, even if it subsequently went extinct when conditions on the surface of the planet deteriorated, and so it, it's now too cold. There's no liquid water on the surface of Mars now. There may very well be liquid water underground because Mars gets warmer as you go deeper, just like the Earth, uh, um, and it's possible if there was ever life on the surface of Mars, it's still living underground. In fact, do you know that the earliest inhabitants, the earliest life on Earth, were microbes who could not tolerate oxygen? We love oxygen, we need oxygen. But oxygen was poison for them. And so when plants started polluting the air with oxygen, they made the surface of the Earth uninhabitable for the original inhabitants of the Earth. So what did they do? They went underground. And their 
are still being made. Organisms that happen to be the surface of the Earth for three billion years have been hiding underground on Earth ever since. And they've watched the trilobites come and go, they've watched the dinosaurs come and go, they've watched the Soviet Union come and go, okay? And they're gonna watch all of us come and go and they're still gonna be there. Um, the, the, um, um, and they could still be there underground on Mars too, the original inhabitants. So if we go to Mars, and explore for fossils, we could find evidence of past life on Mars. And if we could go to Mars and drill, okay, down underground and bring up samples of the water there, if they're survivors of the past life, then we could actually see them uh, and see their biological structure. And this is extremely important um, because, see, look, there's basic reasons for chemistry why we would expect life to be based on carbon. Because the carbon atom has much greater possibilities for forming complex molecules than any other uh, mo uh, atom. But all life on Earth is much more peculiar than that. It uses DNA and RNA, for example. It uses the same 21 amino acids. Out of all the possible information systems that only uses one. So whether you're a bacteria, a mushroom, a bird, or a person, you all use exactly the same information system, okay? Now, this is interesting. Look, you know, I'm from America, and we use the Latin alphabet. So do most Europeans, British, the French, Spanish, Germans, Poles, okay? Now, of course, in Russia, as you know, they use a somewhat modified alphabet, okay? It's a bit different than ours, has some different letters, and some of the same letters have different sounds, but it's the same set of principles, okay? But as you know, uh, there was once a, a very different alphabet here in uh, Mongolia that didn't resemble the uh, Latin or Cyrillic alphabets at all. And in China, they have a different writing system that isn't even an alphabet. It doesn't work by sounds, okay? So if you were an American and you never traveled abroad, you might think that what an alphabet is is our alphabet. And maybe if you went to Europe, you'd be acquainted with the Cyrillic alphabet, okay? But here, the, the ancient uh, Mongolian alphabet, the Chinese alphabet, these are totally different information systems, and yet they accomplish the same thing. You can write books of all of them, okay? Now, so, I mean, the real question here is this. Is life as we know it on Earth what life is, or is it just one example drawn from a much vaster pattern, uh, tapestry of possibilities? That's really what we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out if the universe is alive, and we're gonna find out what life is. And, you know, if you're a practical person, it's gonna be interesting information technology, biotechnology. Well, you know, biotechnology is gonna be one of the main revolutionary technologies of the 21st century, uh, both in itself for medical and agricultural purposes, but also even for information technology purposes. People are working on DNA computers and stuff, but maybe there's a different kind of biological information system can be found on Mars, and maybe it's actually better, or better at certain things. We're finding out. Now, here's the problem you have. Mars is big, and you're gonna have to explore it. You know, as you know, some of the most incredible dinosaur fossils that were ever found were found right here in Mongolia in the 1920s. Well, guess what? People were around on this planet for thousands of years before that happened, okay? Um, those, you know, it, it took a lot of exploration uh, to, to bring that to life. Um, you know, I live in Colorado where actually there's a fair amount of dinosaur fossils, but uh, believe me, you could land a hundred of those robotic Mars rovers in the Rocky Mountains, you'd never find a, a, a dinosaur fossil. It takes real rock hounds, trained Canadian hogs, to go out there, sniff out the clues, find them, and then do digging and pickaxe work and delicate work and, and all of that to, to bring those secrets out. And, and then the drilling and, and trying to find groundwater and maybe it's not to be found right here, maybe it's to be found over there. And so it means you've got to be able to travel around and, 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 and 
there's going to be a whole new type of exploration that needs to be developed if we're going to have a chance of really discovering what there is to be discovered on Mars. Okay? It's an art of combined operations. We were just in a place in the, uh, I think we call it the dummy building, um, the, the, the middle building, uh, and it's a very interesting area, but it's very complex and difficult terrain, even finding your way through it. It's going to involve combined remote sensing data from satellites, drone aerial reconnaissance, and we can use aerial drones on Mars. We have helicopters flying on Mars, the, the person in this world is a little helicopter. Um, we're going to have drones, astronauts on foot, astronauts in motorized vehicles, a science team in the habitat on Mars, science team back on Earth working with them, is an art of combined operations that needs to be developed to learn how to do this, and also an art of what you might call telescopes. Okay, some of you may have heard of this concept of telemedicine, okay, where you have person in a remote rural area, you have a country doctor and he has to do a heart transplant, okay? Like the country doctors know how to do a heart transplant, but you have over the internet communication to the top specialists in New York City and they're guiding him through the operation. That's called telemedicine, so that you can bring the best medicine even to the remotest areas. Well, I'm talking about telescience, okay? Right now, the way people do science on Earth, say if you're a geologist, is you go out into the field in the summer, maybe with a grad student to help you, and you go and roam around, collect some samples, and you bring them back to the lab, and you study them in your lab for six months, then you submit a paper to a publication, and a year later it's published. Um, that's not how we're gonna do it on Mars. The crew on Mars is going to be the tip of the spear of a science team working with them on Earth, okay? Just like the telemedicine, okay? This is an art of combined operations and of telescience, and it needs to be exercised over a large area of terrain, okay? Now, I do not think that NASA and the European Space Agency are addressing this question at all. All they're thinking about is how to get to the moon and back. And to some extent, they're beginning to think about how to get to Mars and back. They're not really thinking about how to conduct operations once they're there. And that's the whole point of the mission, okay? If it's gonna be a science-driven mission, if we're gonna spend billions of dollars to send people to Mars, we damn well better get the maximum science return out of the mission we possibly can. And this is exactly what we can do in Mongolia. In Mongolia, you have these uh, vast deserts of several different kinds in several different places. The Mars V team sold me, told me nine uh, top candidate sites, and then there are another 20 that are interesting too. And well, and, and some of these are of considerable geographical extent. And they have different kinds of terrain, and, and different. some of them are fossiliferous, so even though the kinds of fossils you're looking for in the Gobi are not the same thing we're looking for on Mars, still the exercise of learning how to find them while operating under Mars mission type constraints. A small crew limited to going outside wearing space suits and having to conduct exploration that way and having to simultaneously repair their own equipment and maintain a telescience communication with a remote science team, perhaps in Ulu Batar here, right here at this university maybe, um, and so forth. This is an art that needs to be developed. Um, now, I think that actually with the Starship coming on, um, these new capabilities come into being, I think we could actually have our first science teams on Mars within 10 years. That's why I said humans to Mars within a decade. Well, we need to be figuring out how to do things there now. And we can do that here in Mongolia. And in other words, with these questions, the fundamental questions about the nature of life, about the potential prevalence and diversity of life in the universe can be answered by going to Mars, provided we go to Mars, equipped to explore in a smart way. And the science of doing that, the art of doing that can be worked out. So this is um, 
Here's a map of Mars, and as you can see, uh, Texas is three extra scale. Mars is a lot bigger than Texas. Um, and even Mongolia is probably only about this big. But still, we're going to want to explore large areas with each exploration. We're going to need to have a string of phases. Uh, now, the Mars V group here have worked out a concept for a portable base, so that one year it can be put in this desert, another in another desert, and could learn how to explore all these different kinds of places. Um, the, the, but in other words, I don't think we should concentrate on building a major base in just one place, not to start. After we've explored a lot of places, then you choose the best to build up a major base. And so you can see this concept is a little bit like the concept that Surat, that's the name, uh, put forth of the habitats that could be linked together, kind of like this, based straight line or something like that. Um, and there you go. Um, and then after we've explored a lot of different areas, we've also learned how to explore a lot of different kinds of areas, then we might think about building up a Mars base of considerable size, um, and there, the focus of a Mars base, since we're building a large base, is not only continued exploration in one area, but resource development. How to turn materials into resources. There's no such thing as a natural resource. There's only natural raw materials. It is human beings through human creativity and creation of technology turns materials into resources, okay? And if you can turn the materials of where you live into resources, then you can live there, okay? Then you can live there. Uh, and, you know, I hear your, your president has come up with an idea of transforming Mongolia by planting a billion trees. I like that a lot, actually. I was just out there. I thought, this place could use a billion trees. So could Mars. Um, the, if, if you learn how to make use of the resources, excuse me, if you learn how to create the resources, then you can make, then the environment is habitable for you, and you can e increasingly transform that environment and um, make it more and more habitable for you. And in a way, you know, this is the history of life on Earth. Life, the reason why life on Earth has been a success is because life has a fundamental principle of taking barren environments and turning them into fertile environments, okay? The oxygen that is in our atmosphere is an artifact of life. It wasn't here before life. Life put it there, okay? The soil on the continents is an artifact of life. Life created the soil. And communities of life, symbiotic communities, plants and animals, colonize the continents from the seashores up the mountains. High up as life can go, it goes, making the place ever more fertile. And so this is really what humans are going to go to do to Mars. We're going to make Mars fertile. We're going to transform a dead world into a living one. Uh, and ultimately, it'll be a place not only with a billion trees, but used bookstores, university stores. Okay? And no one will be able to look at it and not be proud of it. Is there time for questions? Is there time for questions? Hold on. Well, um, we're going to have a Q&A right after this one. Okay, so just get off the stage. <laughs> Got it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Silvin, for the informative presentation. Definitely, human exploration. What are your first words? I said, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Um, which is from Shakespeare, but it's what I had to say. Because looked out and it looked like, I imagined it as Mars, as a new world, and as someone might see it landing there for the first time and just being hit with the idea that there's a whole world here to explore 
a whole world here to be known, and a whole world of history waiting to be made. And then one other thing that happened, which uh, I didn't realize how uh, unusual it was until I told other people, but uh, I'm an early riser, you know, we camped out there overnight, and, and I, I did up the crack of dawn, and I went out uh, to, to just look over the country in the dawn, and I saw two wolves, and uh, the, uh, which is something, uh, the, uh, and, but there they were, and, uh, and then when I, I, I told people about that afterwards, they said, what? Uh, that's an omen of great significance here in Mongolia. And, uh, and then to top it off, a falcon came and flew by. And, uh, and oh, the falcon was there. Okay. But the, um, yeah, so we had uh, quite a dramatic experience both with the terrain and, and well, just the, the night there but even more so from startups. I mean, SpaceX is only a 20-year-old company. Uh, and uh, it came in and, you know, in addition to developing some extremely valuable systems, what Elon Musk and his team have managed to show, that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that people in the government-led space industry uh, had thought impossible, or if they thought it was possible, do them in one third of the time at one tenth of the cost. And, uh, you know, um, launch vehicles, okay, that is a high capital investment area to, to get into. Uh, and it was extremely useful to Elon Musk the fact that he had some money when we started SpaceX. Uh, although another successful uh, entrepreneurial rocket company, Rocket Lab, which is a New Zealand company, and New Zealand doesn't even have a space program. They've reached orbit, they're launching satellites. And that was initiated by a working engineer, not a billionaire, who managed to find investors. He had ideas, and he drew the investors, and he created a rocket company. And in fact, the entrepreneurial space revolution makes it possible from anyone from any country who's got an idea to take the initiative. As I said, New Zealand doesn't have a space program, or if they have one, it, it, no one's heard of it. Um, the, um, uh, but they've reached orbit, and there's no reason why a Mongolian couldn't create a, a rocket company if he had, or she had good in investors, or uh, she or he could create a, this is a big opening, I think, a spacecraft company. Um, that is, the, the level of investment threshold there is, is lower. And, you know, the microsatellites are the thing now. There, there are now satellites that weigh 10 kilograms and cost $10 million to build that can do things that previously took 1,000 kilograms and cost a billion dollars to build. And this is the future, and, and there could be uh, a, a micro satellite SpaceX created here in Mongolia, or by Mongolians teaming with Europeans, Japanese, Americans, whomever. Uh, the uh, you know, if you've got the initiative, you can play the game. You, you... Okay. And then finally, I do want to comment one thing with respect to uh, 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 can't pronounce your names. Akio. What? Akio. Akio. Yeah. Okay, his presentation, I agree with him, balloons are very promising. Uh, and this is an excellent place uh, to both do balloon research and also to develop more advanced balloon technologies. He was using a well-established type of balloon technology that is frequently used to launch weather balloons and things. And even with that, you can reach the upper stratosphere. But there are more advanced kinds of balloons that people are thinking about and which are worth researching. Balloons that won't pop when they reach altitude, but can keep floating uh, not only all day, but for weeks. Uh, super pressure balloons, they're called, which are, have been on the drawing boards. And these could have uh, all sorts of applications, both for research as well as remote sensing, communications, things that people do with satellites can be done for 1% the cost with balloons.
Um, they, they, there are reasons to go to the moon for the purpose of going to the moon. Okay, but if you want to go to Mars, you need to go to Mars. Uh, the the uh, people. Th this is a problem that happens in the space program a lot. That there's always people who want to do their program, and they say, if you want to do your program, you need to do my program. Okay, first. Uh, but it, it's rarely true, and it's not true in this case. Moon is a good place to go to do certain kinds of research, set up astronomical observatories, but the idea of going to Mars through a lunar base or a lunar gateway only makes it much more complicated. Uh, and yes, you can practice Mars missions on the moon, but we can practice them a much sooner, much easier, and much more intensively right here in the Goli. <laughs> All right, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Yes. I have a very lame question for you, Dr. Akayama. You know, the number of old flights have been increasing uh, two years back. And because of uh, pandemic, etc., international flights decreased. However, the number of satellites are uh, growing. Do you think there would be any move to go chances to set up ground station tracking the satellites from Gobi? In Gobi, let's say. Yes, uh, just uh, uh, the number of uh, satellites is increasing and increasing and increasing. So uh, we need uh, more uh, ground stations. Uh, and uh, just uh, we have the another networks on the ground, and that is the uh, internet. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, my university, Okayama University, has uh, one ground station. And, uh, and formerly, the, uh, the operator of the uh, ground station have to stay the point. The, the point being the, the uh, in this case, the Okayama University. But just now, uh, for example, Mongol Kosen students can be used my ground stations uh, by using the internet and uh, um, after that, uh, 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 internet and uh, from the ground station to the satellite communications. So, uh, but uh, of course, you know, Japan has a lot of people. A lot of people live in Japan, so uh, some noise is is, uh, is not good for a ground station. So, if the uh, you, if you have the ground station in Gobi Desert, maybe this is a clean clean uh, circumstances uh, of the uh, radiation. So, uh, I think that. That kind of uh, ground station is uh, important too, I think. So let's make it. <laughs> These drones have you know, been magnified, you know, and that's the, what do you think uh, the biggest, highest priority use cases for drones would be for actual Mars band exploration and colonization? Um, reconnaissance. Um, the, uh, I mean, well, first of all, uh, at, I think most people here know that a small uh, aerial drone was flown alongside the Perseverance rover mission to Mars. And this was a small flight vehicle about the size of a toy helicopter. Well, if your memory goes back long enough, in 1997, we landed the first rover on Mars. And it was about the size of a toy car. Now, we have rovers on Mars the size of real cars. 25 years from now, there will be helicopters on Mars the size of real helicopters. Okay, uh, so, but the intermediate stage of helicopters, you know, I, I forget how big Ingenuity, that's the helicopter, is, but a few kilograms. Uh, you know, to have 50 kilogram uh, exploration helicopters can do much more than rovers. You know, the rovers, travel maybe 100 meters in a day. A helicopter could easily travel 100 kilometers in a day and then recharge its batteries on it after exploring a site. So it literally increases mobility a thousand times compared to the rovers. 
The rovers themselves increase to a thousand times compared to a static lander that can just reach out with an arm. Um, but so as independent, and in other words, I, I think that within a few years, NASA should fly a helicopter rover mission to Mars. That is a helicopter that is not just a, a little demonstrator, but is well equipped with science instruments and flying from here to there doing science. But once you have people on Mars, then the helicopter can both do independent science, but it can also function as reconnaissance for the ground crews to find the best places for them to go and the best routes for them to go to get there. Uh, so this is an extraordinary tool. I, I, I don't think that slow-moving ground rovers will have much use once there are people on Mars. But aerial rovers that can move much faster than people would have tremendous use. Is my butt. Okay, it says Mars or bust. Okay. Uh, some of you that probably don't know, but when the pioneers first went west, uh, leaving from St. Louis, which is the point of departure for pioneers to go to the far west, and they were going to Oregon on the Oregon Trail, they painted on their wagons. Oregon or bust. And what that meant was, we're not stopping. We're going to make it to Oregon or we're going to bust on the way. We're not turning back. So this is our slogan, Mars or bust. Thank you. Okay. And I wish I could thank all the people in Mars V for this uh, both this tremendous visit, but also for what you are doing, because I think what you're doing is going to do a lot to help make humans to Mars possible and successful. So thank you.